This is the supplemental information for the presentation, just like in a honeybee column, it takes a team in the UC Davis Hive to win an award. I knew the time allocated for this presentation was very short. I could not deliver the material that I prepared for this lecture. Therefore, I put part of it as supplemental information. In our lab, we have been looking at various species of insects and give emphasis more recently to mosquitoes because mosquitoes are important. They transmit uh, diseases or agents that cause diseases, such as virus. Uh, the mosquito may acquire a, a virus during a blood meal, and the, the virus may replicate, and that's, uh, after a certain period of time, there is enough site of this virus that the mosquito bites another host, uh, then is going to transmit this virus to, to them. Mosquitoes exist in two environments during the life cycle. Uh, they are aquatic environment for the immature stage and the terrestrial environment for the adults. So the adults, males and females, encounter each other, they mate, and the female now needs a blood meal because she needs the nutrients for fertilizing the eggs. So she goes after a host and they get a blood meal. Uh, and then she lays eggs, she finds a suitable place to lay eggs. She might continue this cycle here, and after a certain period of time, she can again uh, find another blood meal. She does not necessarily, in her life, only once have a blood, blood meal, otherwise there will be no problem. But she can has to repeat these things sometimes, have more than one blood meal. And also some other insects. Insects are mosquitoes and insects in general are not one size fits all. There are some insects that gets all the blood meal at once, others that get multiple shorter blood meals, such as the Aedes mosquitoes. But in, in general, when it, she lays eggs, uh, the eggs are going to hatch, and the, the larvae are going to be there, then they, they pupate, and finally the adults emerge, and it goes back to uh, the terrestrial environment. We know that only the females look for a host to get a blood meal. However, there was a very interesting discover, accidental discovery here in the lab. Hello, my name is Mahmoud Nick Bakhzadeh, and I often go by Nick. Nick and Garrison Bass. Garrison was an undergraduate student here, and then he moved on to Stanford, got his PhD, and moved on. Uh, they, together, they found this very interesting uh, observation that Nick accidentally uh, let uh, blood soak uh, cotton roll available to males and the females. And then he noted that the both males and the females drank that blood uh, and the, uh, the, he repeated these experiments and notes that indeed the males also can get a blood meal. Not that they are going to go after you and get your blood, but if the blood is easy to drink, they would drink this blood and they get it, uh, intoxicated by the blood because they cannot digest it. They lack the enzymes for the digestion. And Garrison Bass measured the amount of blood that these mosquitoes are drinking in uh, each of these uh, bites. So the females in general is about, uh, in average, 4.35 microliters of blood that she acquires, whereas a male only acquires 0 0.44 uh, microliters of blood. So we don't have to worry about the males, they do not buy the eyes, but this was an uh, interesting observation in the lab. Uh, the females can has an apparatus that can go inside your skin and find out where the blood vessels are. Males did not evolve in the same way, so therefore they are not able to do the same thing, but if the blood is available easily, such as in the uh, cotton soaked with blood, even with a parafilm, uh, uh, film, a parafilm uh, covering some surface, they can penetrate the parafilm and they can drink the blood to some extent. Our work identifying the first odorant binding protein from mosquitoes and from diptera, uh, it was uh, in collaboration with Dr. Antonio Cornell. Dr. Antonio Cornell not only provided the colony, but he also provided lots of mosquitoes at that particular time. Uh, uh, back then, we needed to 
first extracted the uh, proteins from olfactory tissues, compared to the extract from proteins from non olfactory tissues, and identify the proteins that are specific to the olfactory tissue. Then we are isolate these proteins in gel and identify them by getting the sequence of the protein cloning them and finally demonstrated that they are olfactory proteins. Now it's much easier because we have genome transcriptomes and so on, but back then we have to do the hard work of isolating each particular uh, protein. And we did that and successfully with the uh, protein from q like skin cafasiatus CQOBP1. We also did the same thing, again, in collaboration with Dr. Antonio Cornell uh, and the others. Uh, we isolated the first proteins from uh, the yellow fever mosquito, uh, Aedes aegypti, uh, and the isolated that protein that we utilized later on also to express the protein for other studies. We also isolated the first protein from Anophila gambia. And from Anophila gambia, we uh, collaborated with uh, Dr. David Wilson. At that time, I was in entomology, David Wilson uh, already in the department of MCB. Our students uh, played a crucial role in this project. Uh, his graduate students, Mark Woglitz uh, and uh, Tanya Morgan from our lab. Tanya produced this protein in large quantity, expressed this protein that uh, Mark and David utilized to crystallize the protein and determine the 3D structure, the crystal structure of the protein. It was the first evidence that we had that the structures from mosquito odor antibody protein differ from the structures of the proteins from Lepidoptera. It's not very surprising because we know that the, in insects, one size does not fit all. Uh, the, the frame, the, the, the basic uh, structure is the same. The major difference is that the mosquitoes do not have this long extended C-terminus that in the case of uh, Lepidopter goes in the binding pocket uh, at low pH. Here, uh, it's still a pH-dependent mechanism, but uh, different from that one, except that as proposed by David Wilson, uh, this uh, C-terminus move out from the ligand, expose the ligand to the environment. We published that work in the BBRC, Biochemical and Biophysical Research Communication, got the cover of that, has been widely uh, cited in the paper. We also determined the structure of a CQOBP1, the first protein that isolated. This one we did in collaboration with John Clark from Harvard and with uh, uh, Jim Ames here from UC Davis Department of Chemistry. They both got the structure and the crystal structure and the enema, the soluble structure, as you call, uh, they both have it, uh, very close uh, and it was basically identical, the structure. Uh, uh, in these studies, we demonstrated that there is hydrogen bonded triad that is very important. It is sitting here as it illustrated there on the left side with the tyrosine 54, histidine 23, and the valine 125. They make these three hydrogen bonds, and these hydrogen bonds is very important to keep the C-terminus covering the binding pocket there. Once the pH change, uh, these uh, uh, hydrogen bonds are no longer there, and this is going to move away and expose the ligand to uh, the aqueous environment, basically releasing the ligand. The ligand in this case in here is uh, the mo mosquito oviposition pheromone, uh, pheromone that was identified many years ago in 1970s by Dr. John Pickett, uh, identifying from the eggs of the raft of mosquitoes' eggs, he identified this compound called the mosquito oviposition pheromone. So uh, again, there is here a uh, pH sensed lock. Uh, and that pH is going to be sensed and release the pheromone in a pH-dependent uh, change. It's not a conformational change identical to what we find found in Lepidoptera. We use another dipter in the lab, Drosophila. Uh, it's a very good uh, insect model, and we did the most of the work in Drosophila in collaboration with Deborah Kimball. Uh, again, I was not in, in the MCB at the time, uh, Deborah was here, but I was in the Department of uh, Entomology. 
Uh, and with Deborah, we uh, were able to express the receptor from bombic simori in the so-called empty neuron of the fruit fly. The empty neuron that is a, is a, is a technique that was developed by John Carlson at Yale. Uh, there is a fruit fly with the AB3A neuron that's not have uh, that we, is uh, empty so that we can introduce uh, a desired receptor there. And we did that with the bombic small receptor, uh, BMOR1, expressing the empty neuron of the fruit fly. At that time, Zain recorded from all the sensilla, the basic conica sensilla, before starting that, to make sure that it wasn't, there was no surprise. But there was a surprise for us, is that the AB3 a, uh, is completely uh, AB3 sensilla, basic conica sensilla general, A or B, is not responding to bombic call. However, there is another sensilla, another basic conica sensilla, AB4, and the AB4A has a neuron that responds to bombic call. Uh, so that was interesting to find for the first time that there is a sensilla in the fruit fly that responded to the pheromone of this uh, moth. We have no idea why they do that, but th there was a sensilla there. Uh, then uh, uh, Deborah uh, expressed this uh, receptor and they provided the flies. I recorded the fly now, express BMOR1 in the empty neuron. Then he goes there and they record from the empty neuron. Now it's not, no longer empty, but it's, uh, it's filled with a B, B, uh, the bomb or, or, or durante receptor 1. Uh, and he notes that the, the rise in potential and the also the termination of the signal was very slow, uh, indicating that something is missing uh, in this environment for the proper uh, function of this receptor. We continue the work with Drosophila later on, and this time not only Deborah Klimbo, but also Artyom Kopp uh, came to uh, help us. Uh, they express now uh, two types of flies. Uh, Deborah expressed the fly now with the receptor from uh, AB4A, uh, that neuron has a receptor called OR70 in the fly. We express that receptor in the empty neuron to make sure that this is the neuro, this is the res, neuron that responds. This is the receptor that responds to bombic call, and then we confirm that the OR7A from the fruit fly is sensitive to bombic call. That's one part of the work. The other part of the work that Archeon played a crucial role here. It was to express now bombic small OR1 into the trichordial sensilla of the fruit fly. Because we know that the trichordial sensilla is the sensilla that responded to this compound, vaccinyl acetate, which is a compound that's uh, is one of the functions called the uh, pheromone of the fruit fly. Uh, it's a larger compound, and they respond well to that compound. So we wanted to express in that sensilla as well, and we, uh, the, the, the fly was generated that, uh, by Artyon that expressed this receptor, Zain record, and got a very beautiful response. As opposed to the basic conica sensilla that didn't, didn't have the full environment for the expression, for the function of the, this receptor, the trichordial sensilla T1, when record from there, the response was similar to the response that we record from the sensilla of the moth itself. So it's a proper environment and it demonstrated that this uh, receptor can be expressed there. Julien Pelletier, a uh, French postdoc who was in the lab here, did very important work for the lab. One of them that I would like to highlight today is this for the first time. He was able to knock down an olfactory protein in mosquitoes. No one succeeded before that, and he did, uh, and he knocked down uh, the protein, the odorant binding protein 1, CQ OBP1. And then, uh, together with Aline Guidolin, uh, he was able to demonstrate that uh, when you knock down the express of this uh, CQ OBP1, the response to the mosquito reposition pheromone, the same mosquito reposition pheromone that I mentioned before, that was discovered by John Bickett, the response, the electrophysiological response decreased. 
So it was the first evidence that a direct link between an OBP and the uh, detection of an olfactory signal in Culex mosquitoes. Jamie Lu. Hi, my name is James. I'm a medical student of Midwestern University. Uh, Jamie Lu came into the lab as an undergraduate student and he continued after graduation uh, and he then moved on to graduate uh, to medical school. Uh, before James, we thought that the DET is a special and a contact repellent that's it. But James demonstrated for the first time that DET is also a feeding deterrent. So he did some experiment that I'm not going to explain in much detail here, but there was an arena uh, with blood either spiked with uh, DET or not, and this blood was covered by a membrane with parafilm. And uh, James demonstrated that uh, the mosquitoes that goes and probe there, when they probe, uh, if there is DET, they uh, retract. And in average, they only stay there for 32 seconds, whereas the mosquitoes that are uh, perforated, the membrane that does not have DET, in the blood, they stay there in average for 92 seconds. Very significant difference uh, between the two demonstrated that the DT is also a feed deterrent. Flavia Franco. Hi, I'm Flavia Franco. Flavia Franco came to us from the University of Sao Paulo, the campus of Piracicaba, and she took various projects in here. One of them was this project to identify what makes these two receptors ident uh, to be so specific? There is one receptor that we identified earlier in collaboration with Chuck Luedge that it responds to scatol. It's a receptor called CQR10. And there is another receptor that responds specifically to uh, indol, CQR2. They have inverse specificity. One is specific to scatol, and it gives a smaller response to indol. Another one is specific to indol and gives a smaller response to uh, scatol. The question is that what makes this receptor so specific? So let's look for the specificity determinants. We thought that it's going to be multiple amino acid residues. Flavia took this work that was very time consuming. And at the end of the road, she found out together with Ping Shi Shu that there is a single amino acid residues that dictate this specificity. Then I approached our colleague Vladimir, and Vladimir recruited his graduate student, Brandon Harris, to work together and to figure out why this single amino acid residue is doing what it's doing for these receptors. So the receptors are CQ10 on the left side here that respond to scatol, the red compound. And the receptor on the right side is CQR2, the blue one that recept, uh, responds to indole with uh, the blue compound. So the difference between indole and scatol, they have only a methyl group that's a difference. And that makes a big difference in terms of the response of the receptor. Uh, the, the one on the left uh, responds uh, with lower sensitivity to indole, and the one on the right responds with lower sensitivity to uh, scatol. So she found one point in mutation. When she mutated that at the end of the road, we have now that if you mutate one single amino acid residue, the scatol receptor becomes an indol receptor. And the indol receptor becomes a scatol receptor. So now, why is that so? Then we turn to uh, modeling. And we collaborate again, uh, as I said, with Vladimir and Brandon. And Brandon first, dismiss one particular assumption that we had in mind. We thought that because the alanina 73 is the key amino acid residue, we thought that this might be very important in the binding pocket in terms of associated directly with the ligand. We are wrong. It does not make direct contact with the ligand. Uh, what it, uh, Brandon showed by studying various models, and I'm going to try to summarize it here in one single slide, uh, is that these amino acid residues cause the appropriate volumetric space sensitivity to one as opposed to the other ligand. If you change, for example, alanina 73 
with leucine 73, which is basically switching the OR receptor for scatol into the OR receptor for indole, uh, we see the backbone in the helix shift to the left. However, this, this, uh, uh, this chain, uh, the side chain, penetrated the binding pocket and caused a uh, repacking or maybe uh, uh, a rearrangement of uh, these uh, residues around and it causes a new space that switches better for indoor. That was very surprising because we always thought that if there is amino acid residue that is an important specificity determinant, that amino acid residue would directly contact the ligand. Our col international collaborations are very important for our lab and for our research. Here's one of our collaborations with a group from the Funda Citrus. These are all PhD level. Uh, researchers that collaborate together under the leadership of Harold Volpe. Hi, I am Harold Volpe. Uh, together we discovered the pheromone for this very important species called the Asian citrus psyllid. The Asian citrus psyllid is also named Diaphorina citri, the scientific name. Uh, it's an a insect that carries the agent, the bacterium, that causes the uh, greening. And the green is a very devastating disease uh, in the citrus industry. We discovered the pheromone, and then we tested this synthetic pheromone formulated in the field here in Pomona. Uh, and everything works so well. We are very excited. We went to Brazil, and we tested the same pheromone, the same formulation, and didn't work. A long story short, the insects here were not infected with the, uh, with the bacteria. The insects in Brazil in the field were infected with the bacteria. The sensitivity to the pheromone changed dramatically. So they require a much higher, 50 times higher dose of the pheromone to have the same response. Another very important international collaboration uh, with, with Zhao. Hello, I'm Zhao Yi. And the Indian. I'm in Liang Wang. So these are two scholars from China. Uh, they came to my lab earlier on, and they returned to China, and we start collaborating this project for about five years now. Uh, we are interested in understanding how this beetle, uh, the Holotrichia parallela, uh, detects this pheromone. This pheromone was identified by me more than 30 years ago. Uh, is a isoleucine derived compound. First of all, there was no uh, amino acid derived compound as a pheromone, but we found the first one here uh, in this species. And after that, the various group found in various different species, there are amino acid derivatives that are utilized as a pheromone. This is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that this species only flies every other day. So, uh, the females come to the field, release the pheromone mates, next day she disappears, and then the following day she comes back. So it's a circabadian rhythm of pheromone release. The question that we had is that, what about the re re reception of this pheromone by the males? Is the male uh, able to detect this pheromone at any time, or do they have the same sort of circabadian rhythm? First, uh, we discover, after testing various candidates, we discover the pheromone receptor. The pheromone receptor is called HPRA-OR14, uh, HPRA-OR14. We knock down uh, this express of this receptor via an RNAi and demonstrate that these beetles do not respond the same way anymore. Uh, clearly, this was uh, the pheromone receptor gene. Then we look at the gene expression. And we noticed first that in the days that the, the, the insects were, uh, the insects were uh, active, the day that the females would be calling, uh, the males uh, had in the night very high titers of pheromone and in the daytime very low. So we then continue and we studied the cycle for the entire life of the beetle and found out that they also have the same cycle of a fer uh, pheromone re release and the pheromone titer of the transcript of this receptor also 
follow the same uh, circabiodian rhythm. This cartoon here illustrates what happens with HPAR OR14, that uh, one day the colon day and colon night is very high level, the next day it decreases dramatically, the next night uh, is high, and so on. This is not true for all receptors. HPAR OR1, for example, which is a receptor for a green leafy volatile compound, a non pheromone compound, is continuously there at the same level. So this is a very, a very interesting discovery that the, not only the females follow a circuit bad ion rhythm of pheromone release, but the males also follow the same circuit bad ion rhythm of pheromone reception. This work came out and it was uh, uh, got the attention of the press. Here comes in the Eureka Alerta, and here uh, it's called that for this beetle, date night comes every other day. And also more recently in this artic article here in the Scientific American. I didn't have time to talk about my work with the CDC, uh, which is a uh, title Overcoming Sensitivity to Deet as a Mosquito Repellent, that the work that we do here uh, with the participation of uh, three undergraduate students, Sarbot Singh, uh, Tiffany Ng, and Katie Vartanian. I also didn't have time to talk about the work of many uh, collaborators over the years, uh, many of whom I do not have a picture of them here in these galleries, but I apologize that I didn't have time to emphasize the work of many of these collaborators, so many important pieces of research that came uh, from the lab, thanks to these various uh, uh, people that participated in our research activity over the years. Thank you very much. Uh, for watching, and I hope uh, you agree that this uh, cast of thousands deserve the uh, Faculty Distinguished Research Award. Thank you very much.